Hi, welcome um, to our next segment. Um, we're moving out of the Renaissance period and we're going to be focusing on the Baroque period. Um, in this first segment concerning Baroque art, we're going to be looking at 17th century Baroque architecture. Um, we'll do what we did last time. We'll look at um, artists in Italy and we'll also move over to North Europe and also look at how um, the Baroque style developed there as well. So here's a map and hopefully you're familiar with um, Italy now. And we'll also be looking at the Baroque um, style in France as well um, in later segments. So the Baroque is often thought of, a, of as a period of artistic style that used exaggerated and that's I, I want you to use that word exaggerated motion and um, and clear, easily interpreted detail to produce drama, tension, exuberance, and grandeur in sculpture, painting, architecture, literature, dance, theater, and music. Um, the style began around the 1600s in Rome, Italy, and then it did spread to most of Europe. The popularity and success of the Baroque style was encouraged by the Catholic Church, which had decided at the time of the Council of Trent in which had decided at the time of the Council of Trent in response to the Protestant Reformation that the arts should communicate religious themes and direct um, an emotional involvement. So this was a movement that was sort of in, you know, in protest of the um, Protestant Reformation that we started to discuss in earlier segments. Um, the aristocracy, aristocracy also saw um, the dramatic style of Baroque architecture as an art of expressing um, to visitors um, triumph, power, and control. Um, the Baroque style can be observed in all of the visual arts, including painting, sculpture, and architecture. And often um, what we see happening is that there's a unification of, of all three mediums in one, in one space or in one location, and it, be, it becomes a very sort of theatrical display. Um, this is our first work that we're going to be discussing. Um, this is um, Jesu 2 um, and this is um, the mother church of the Society of Jesus, Jesuits, which was a Catholic religious order. And so this is one of the fa facade, the facade of the church is considered one of the first truly Baroque facades, um, introducing the Baroque style into architecture during this period. Um, the church served as a model for um, um, a lot of Jesuit churches all over the world, especially in America. Um, and the Church of the um, Jesu is located in the Piazza del Jesu in Rome. Um, although Michelangelo, at the request of the Spanish Cardinal um, at that time, offered out of devotion to design the church free, the endeavor was funded by Cardinal Alessandro Farne Farnese, um, who was the grandson of Pope Paul III. Um, the Pope, who had authorized the founding of the Society of Jesus, um, so that's why he sort of took control of it, control over it. Ultimately, the main architects involved in the construction were Giamaco Brazzi, wait, Barazzo di Vignola, um, and um, he was sort of the family architect of the Farnese family, and then also Giacomo della Porta. So those were two architects that worked on this. We'll also be looking at the interior of this church and looking at some really beautiful frescoes that were painted by another artist. So give, just to give you some contextual information, because, you know, you know, religion, especially the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, are really important in the way they influenced art. Um, the early 16th century was a time of great instability. Um, for the Catholic Church, they were suffering major losses to the Protestant movement. Nearly all of the Northwestern Europe had broken away from the Catholic Church and was moving toward um, the Protestant religion as their primary Christian sect. Um, the Catholic Church responded in what we now call the period of Counter-Reformation. So we have the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. Um, it reacted directly with the Council of Trent, which met, which met 25 times between 1545 and 1563 to address their problems. The Council answered the Protestant criticisms of the Catholic Church with some internal reforms, such as the outlawing of um, simony 
for simony, simony S-I-M-O-N-Y, buying and selling of church offices, and pluralism, holding many offices at one time. In addition to the bureaucratic reform, the church distinguished itself by furthering, further specifying and tightening doctrine about biblical canyon, sacraments, and salvation. In relation to their characteristic loyalty to the Catholic Church, um, the early Jesuits were famous for their three main goals and activities, um, stopping the spread of Protestant, Protestantism, um, founding colleges, and sending missionaries all over the world to gain converts and spread Catholicism. Well, wow, that was a lot of history. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but it's important. Um, so we're going to look at the interior of the church as well. Um, the construction of the church began on um, June 26, 1568. Um, and Vignola, um, it's, it, it, this was Vignola's design. And um, Vignola, one of the architects, was assisted by the Jesuit um, Giovanni Trestano, who took over for Vignola in 1571. When he died in 1575, he was succeeded by the Jesuit architect Giovanni de, R de Rosas. Um, Giacome della Porta was involved in the construction of the cross vault um, dome and the apse. So various ar obviously various architects worked on this building. Um, the facade of the church is divided into two sections. The lower section is divided by um, six pairs of um, pilasters. So here's the upper and lower section. And then here are the pilasters that they're referring to with Corinthian capitals. Um, so we see that architectural order. While the upper section is divided with four pairs of um, pil pilasters. Um, the upper section is joined to the lower section by a volute on each side, uh, and the main doors stand under a curvilinear tympanum. So you can sort of see here what they're referring to. Above the main door, one can see a shield with the letters IHS, and um, this represents um, the Christogram. Um, these are basically the initials of Christ. Um, the facade also shows the papal coat of arms and a shield with the initialism SPQR, um, tying the church closely to the people of Rome. The name of the church is referred to, is the name of Jesus referred to, is referred to in its original Greek um, um, form, and that is um, I-H, well anyway, you can look at it um, in my lecture notes. Um, so anyway, basically this church is dedicated, um, and it's named um, for Jesus, um, and because of that Greek um, reference to his name, um, the first three letters um, become the monogram, um, which is a symbol of the Jesuits, um, and, and you can see that again, the I-H-S over here. Oops. Um, and there are many characteristics um, that make this Baroque. Um, it has a mixture of horizontal and vertical lines. So um, you see that in the facade. And then these scrolls um, on the sides flanking both the upper order, flanking the upper order of pilasters really add this idea of movement and drama that we talked about earlier in, in describing what Baroque style is. And so it's a little harder to see in architecture. You'll see it more. I think you'll understand it better in painting. But it's really this idea of drama, tension, um, movement, um, theater, um, in terms of, uh, of, of the style. Um, and so, you know, this curved kind of, um, this curved, um, scroll on the sides, and then this sort of in and out movement. There's sort of a rhythm in the repetition of the um, pilasters. Also, these buildings, in terms of the facade, when light would shine upon them in different um, at different parts of the day, it creates these sort of recesses of shadows that also sort of break up the surface and add sort of to the tension um, that is a, a defining characteristic of the Baroque. Here's a, a better look into the interior of the church and also a floor plan of the church, which, which has changed the basilica church plan that um, we have looked at before. Um, the aesthetics across the Catholic church as a whole were strongly influenced by the Council of Trent, which we talked about earlier. 
Although the council itself said little about church architecture, its suggestion of simplification prompted Charles um, Borromeo to reform ecclesiastical building practices. So they started to basically make changes um, to, to the traditional basilica church plan. Um, the internal layout of um, Jesu II is especially is essentially made up of a single nave now with no aisles. So they've kind of taken away those aisles, and now it's flanked by interconnected chapels on either side. So with this design, the church plan emphasizes a really huge open space now and forces um, and forces us and the worshiper to focus on the high altar um, and anyone sitting in this space can see it. Um, so that was an important um, change that they made. Um, this layout is perfectly suited for preaching to large crowds and the celebration of Mass, both of which are particularly important to the Jesuit order. So again, to reiterate, they, they took away the aisles, they opened up this space, the nave, it's much more open, and um, it really, and then the, you have these little side chapels here, and it really allowed just about everybody, no matter where they were positioned, um, to really get a good view of the focal point, which was the apse and the altar. So this is um, a fresco that is done on the ceiling of the Church of Jesu. So this is a fresco that we're going to be talking about by the artist Giovanni Battista. Um, and as you can see, this really is a combination of what I was talking about, sculpture, architecture, and painting, and that has been unified, sorry about that, um, that's been unified into sort of this one space. Um, and it really is quite dramatic. Um, it's really different than some of more of this restraint works that we see with um, the Renaissance, um, high Renaissance painters um, from Italy. Ex maybe excluding mannerism, which I thought was pretty bizarre, but um, definitely this is um, very dramatic. And so as you enter the church, or as a worshiper would enter the church, they are immediately met by this stunning ceiling fresco. Um, the title is The Triumph of the Name of Jesus, which again is appropriate because of the church and its function. Um, and uh, Batista painted this between 1676 and 1679. Um, and this was about a century after the church was built. Batista was relatively a new artist at the time and was recommended by Bernini, who we're going to be looking at later, um, to paint um, Jesu II. In addition to the ceiling frescoes, uh, another, um, sorry, but, but Batista was also responsible for painting the church's dome and apse. So when we focus on the, the ceiling fresco, the triumph of the name of Jesus, um, we see Jesus represented as the monogram that we spoke about earlier, um, the IHS, um, from which comes this sort of blinding light. I'll zoom in there. I have a better one where you can actually see a better view of this. Um, the light seems to break a hole through the ceiling. So it's almost like this is real, like heaven sort of opening up and this light is sort of shining through. Um, um, and sort of breaking this hole toward paradise. Um, it floats heavenward, um, surrounding by angels and saints, um, in contrast to characters and sinners who are being hurled back down to death. So here we see sort of the saved, uh, you know, sort of rising up into this light. And then here we're going to look at some details of these sinners that are sort of falling back down to earth. Um, uh, um, Many heretics are made of three-dimensional stucco as well, which I'll, I'll give you a viewer a, a closer look. Um, um, these were added later by um, two artists, um, Ercolo Raghi and Leonardo Retti. Um, and these actually project out of the painting and really amplify this illusion. So let me give you some better details. So this is what they're talking about here. So here are the sinners um, that are sort of falling back down to heaven. And this is all painted. I know this, this is crazy. And so there's actually this sort of built up piece right here where it sort of looks like they're sort of falling out of and over the architecture. Even this, the shadow here where it actually looks like a physical shadow is painted to give that illusion that they're actually this sort of three dimensional, this grouping sort of falling um, back down to earth. 
Uh, and it's really quite extraordinary. And this is what Baroque style is all about. This, you know, this very drama, tension, um, and, and this combination of, of visual media. You have architecture, you have painting, you have sculpture, all um, in one work. So um, here you get a better idea. So here are these sort of built up sort of stucco pieces that are painted. Um, and again, it's, it's really quite um, illusionistic. Um, and really very much like the theater in terms of, you know, when you think of, of um, stage backgrounds or backdrops and things like this, um, you know, that's what, that's why they sort of associate this sort of drama and theater to Baroque. Um, this particular fresco and the stucco figures that accompany it serve as um, a threefold purpose in furthering the Jesuit agenda. First of all, the use of Baroque technique. Um, like the movements of the figures, the bright colors. It definitely has an emotional appeal, and that's something else with the Baroque. We'll, we'll really start to emphasize that emotion and this sort of emotional reaction to the work that we really didn't get with um, High Renaissance painting. And the contrast of light and dark um, all add to this really awesome sort of extravagance of the church. Um, and this really was a, a great propaganda tool in helping to differentiate Catholic art from the much more plain art preferred by Protestants. So the Catholics really loved all that ritual and glitz and, and you know, the ceremony and, you know, wanted it to be very gorgeous and luxurious. And so that's sort of how you can tell a difference between sort of, you know, Catholic art, or, you know, that was made during the Counter-Reformation versus the um, Protestant, more simpler restraint art during um, the Reformation. In addition, it attempts to use art to incorporate drama, magnificence, and spirituality into daily prayer. So this was supposed to, um, you know, infuse that into the worshiper's practice of Christianity. And finally, and probably most importantly to the Society of Jesus, the fresco served as a teaching tool in its focus on the contrast between sin and heresy in opposition to the veneration of the name of Jesus in the Catholic faith. Um, so quite impressive. Um, we're going to move and look at another church. Um, this was done by Francisco Borromini, who was an Italian architect born in Italy, and he was a leading figure in the emergence of Roman Baroque architecture. He's a keen student of the architecture of Michelangelo, and yes, Michelangelo, in addition to sculpture and being a great painter, he was also a fantastic architect. Unfortunately, we weren't able to look at um, the work of a lot of these old master architects um, like Michelangelo because they aren't included, in the AP um, list, and, and for sake of time, we just didn't have time to look. But Michelangelo was also a fantastic sculptor, I mean architect. He actually designed the dome of the new St. Peter's, so hopefully you're familiar with that. He's the one that um, designed that. And um, so Borromini was actually a student of Michelangelo, and the ruins of classical Greek and Roman art obviously inspired him. Borromini developed an inventive and, dis uh, and distinctive if somewhat idiosyncratic architecture, um, employing the ma ma manipulation of classical architectural forms, geomet geometrical rationale in his plans, and also infusing the sort of symbolic meaning in his buildings as well. So here's the facade, or one of the, the facade of the church. and. And here's where you really, I think this facade is, is very Baroque and really demonstrates what I was trying to talk about earlier with the Jesu, um, the second or two church. Um, it's very dramatic, as you can see, and see how it concaves inward and outward. It's almost like a rolling wave. Um, and this is very much in line with Baroque characteristics of drama and movement. There's also this use of solids and voids, um, again, as the light sort of moves um, across the sky at different you know, parts of the day, it creates shadows um, and captures the light um, and shade. And so the building itself, actually, the facade sort of changes and, and there are these recesses of, you know, dark shadows that form on the facade. And so this all really feeds into this idea of drama, movement and action. Here is the church interior, and again, it, the interior is just as extraordinary and complex as the facade. The three principal parts can be identified vertically. 
as the lower order at ground level. So um, the transition zone of the pendentives, um, I'm sorry, I was looking at here, and, um, and the oval coffer dome with its oval lantern. So here's the elevation I was talking about earlier. I probably should make that a little bit bigger. Um, the plan and sections show the layout of this cramped and difficult site. So actually the site it was on was, was a very difficult construction site um, because the church is on the corner um, with the cloister next to it um, and both face onto the Via um, Pia, the street. Um, the, monas the monastic buildings um, straddle the site beyond which Bormini intended to design a garden. So he, he was really dealing with a very difficult space, this sort of corner space um, that he had to design this church for. So here, you know, here's the church entrance. Um, we'll take a look at the interior. It's gorgeous in this dome. Um, there's a stair actually that leads up and, and goes into the tower or the lantern. And then the altar is back here. And then here you see it's really crammed up against this, um, this cloister, um, the church cloister on this side. And yes, you do need to know the floor plan. Both churches I've talked about so far are on your list of 250 AP works that you have to know. So what Borromini was interested in, he was interested in classical architecture. And I think you definitely can pick that up with the columns and the, you know, the the architectural orders. Um, it does look classical, but it's it's presented in a very non-classical way, um, especially the way this sort of wave or the building undulates. Um, you have these tall Corinthian columns here on the lower elevation um, and that stand on plinths and um, bear the main entablature over here. Um, these define the main framework of the two stories and the, the tripartite bay division. Um, between the columns, you have smaller columns um, with, the, with their entablature weave behind the main column, and in turn, they frame um, these niches. So here you see these, um, these little tiny columns in here. So again, it's this sort of rhythm of, you know, large, small, large, small, you know, in, out, in, out. Um, and so it, it really has movement when you really look at the facade. Um, and so these, these smaller columns really frame um, these the various niches, windows, and also a variety of sculptures that also um, adds sort of to the texture and breaking up the facade and the main door. Um, and let me look at some other views. Let's move up to the second part of the elevation. So you have this sort of circular oval um, eidacule, I think that's what it's called, A-E-D-I-C-U-L-E. Um, on this upper order, and the oval framed medallion um, borne aloft the angel. So you hear, you hear you have these little angels that are sort of supporting, and I'll show you some details of that, this medallion. Um, and then you have various, um, you know, some statues. Um, so let's look at the inside. We'll look more at the outside. And this is what I was talking about, too, in terms of the, the sort of recesses and these sort of light and dark voids and the way light um, is actually part and a really important part in, in the architecture as well um, and, and plays a function. So here's this oval sort of medallion that they're talking about. And here are these angels. I'm going to zoom in on them. Because they're, they're quite dramatic and charming. They're, they're really, he's, he sculpted them in this very dramatic, they're almost caught in this sort of mid-action. Um, you know, this one has its arms. This one's trying to support the medallion. Um, but again, very classical. There's a lot of classical elements here. But the key with Baroque, um, especially when we're talking about Bormini, is that they're presented in a non-classical way. And here's some other, here's another view of the building, too. Again, architecture is tricky sometimes because you really have to look at a lot of different slides from different angles to really appreciate it. And you really can only appreciate it if you're really actually in front of it. All right, so let's take a look inside. 
In the lower part of the church, the main altar is on the same longitudinal axis as the door, and there are two altars um, on the cross axis. Um, so here's um, the main altar, and I don't think we can see the other two altars. Um, um, with, the with this interior, Borromini created an undulating movement as well, um, and its effect is enhanced by this variation in treatment of these bays um, between the columns here. So here we have these columns and these different bays um, with niches. And so he's, you know, to sort of add drama and movement to the facade, you have these niches um, and moldings in the doorways. Um, and architectural historians have described how the bay structure of this lower order can have a def definite um, rhythmic reading. Again, so it's sort of in and out, you know, in, out, you know, things jutting outward, recessing inward, you know, you have these beautiful sculptures, and it, it just is, is very, you know, using these sort of classical elements, but again, and I know I sound like a broken record, presenting them in a non-classical way where they're dramatic and they have movement and it's very theatrical. And, um, so here's a detail of this exquisite dome. I mean, it is, it is gorgeous. Um, so we have these pendentes um, that are part of the transition area, um, and where they sort and where the undulating, almost cross-like form of the lower order is reconciled with the oval opening in the dome here. Um, the arches which spring from the diagonal place columns of the lower wall order to the frame frames the altar entrance, um, and it rises to meet this oval entablature, um, and so defines the space of the pendentives in which round these sort of, so this is the entablature here, I'm sorry, maybe I should go back and look, um, and then you have, sorry, I don't have a very good slide, and then you have these um, roundels that are set um, in these pendentives. So if you remember when we talked about the, the Haiga Sophia, the dome there, um, this would be something that you could probably compare and contrast to. Um, it might be asked to you on the um, big AP art history exam. Here's a better view of it. And so what they were talking about too, these, these are these columns that they were talking about and, and just how, and they basically are just talking about how this, the, it really transitions, you know, from this sort of square space into this beautiful oval dome. Um, the oval entablature to the dome has a crown um, foliage and frames a view of deep set interlocking um, coffers. So here is what they're referring to of octagonal oct octagons, crosses, hexagons, and, and they sort of diminish in size the higher they rise. So here you Here's this sort of foliage that he's talking about, and this sort of entablature, this oval entablature, and then as we move up, you have these different geometric forms, and they, they get smaller. Um, light floods in from the windows in the lower dome that are hidden um, by the oval opening and from windows in the sides of the lantern. Um, in, higher arc in, in a hierarchical structure of light, the illuminated lantern, which is the symbol um, of the Holy Trinity, is most brightly lit. And um, the coffering of the dome is thrown into a sharp, deep relief, and light gradually filters downward to the darker, lower body of the church. So as you can see here, it's very light and bright, really here at the center. And then as you would move down, um, it would become darker into the uh, main body of the church. And again, that too is very theatrical and dram you know, dramatic um, and has this sort of movement about it um, that is very Baroque. So um, here we are. This is another beautiful dim. And I think you do really get a sense of the, the light and sort of the transition from light, the sort of heaven, um, to the sort of dark, more earthly um, lower part of the church. So as viewers look up at the dim, it appears to rise away above us. Um, shapes recess and decrease in size. And so Borromini has used optical illusions to create movement and complex, and complex geometric patterns. The dome seems like heaven, um, and a dove floating above seems as if it's suspended. So here's the little dove right here. 
And I'm sorry, this was supposed to be the most brightly lit part of the church here. So, it's really gorgeous. And I'm quickly going to bring up a slide of the Dome of the Hagia Sophia, just so um, you have that as a reference. So, here is a slide of the Hagia Sophia, which is the um, early Christian Byzantine church that we looked at. And this was, um, this is this is the dome. Um, it has that clear story of windows. Um, that really is a defining characteristic. So I have no doubt that um, you know you might be asked maybe to compare and contrast um, the this you know the Italian um, Baroque church dome that we just looked at in the Hagia Sophia. So again, try to go back and sort of reference these, and maybe go back and review the Hagia Sophia, and so it's still fresh in your mind. So I'm going to end here. Um, I have a part two, um, and part two will be we'll be discussing French um, Baroque architecture. So stay tuned.